Adrian Hampton was one of my mass communications professors while attending school at TJC. Widely loved by the students for her upbeat and friendly attitude, as well as her passion for the subject of journalism. She was a kind and encouraging mentor in our education, and I would be remiss to say without her as well as others' praise and guidance for my early work in school, it would be doubtful I would have pursued this journey I am now on. Please join me as we go and meet Adrian Hampton. So, I'm here with a professor of mass communications, Adrian Hampton. She was uh, my professor here at TJC, and uh, she was also everybody's uh, favorite professor, from what I remember. Uh, <laughs> at, at least you were the only professor that people said, you know, I feel really bad skipping her class. <laughs> but... Uh, Anyway, I'll let her sort of introduce herself, kind of what she does here, and then we'll get into her life story. Well, uh, like you said, Isaac, I am a professor of mass communication. I've been here since 2020, which was a wonderful year to start teaching. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm also one of the um, advisors, one of the co-advisors for the Drumbeat Student Media at Tyler Junior College. Yeah. So... When did you decide, like, th this is the career I want to go into? That was a long path. I come from a family of teachers, and I swore I would never be a teacher. Like, that was the <laughs> last thing I ever wanted to do. And so when I went to college, you know, I went journalism and wanted to work in PR and ended up doing that for most of my career. And then... You know, about 10 years into my career, and I was finishing up my master's degree at night, um, a friend of mine worked here at TJC. She was the department chair at the time. Uh, and she said, hey, why don't you come teach an adjunct class, pay off the student loans, make a little extra money? I said, okay. <laughs> I'll come teach one class. And then a semester later, I said, damn it, I'm making a career change. And ever since then, I've been working toward getting to full-time teaching yeah so and i kind of want to go back to your college years because mm -hmm. we were on a uh tip -a trip yes and, and you told me you told the group in the van about uh a job you had <laughs> while going through uh through college okay through college <laughs> so there's a couple of funny jobs that, that i've had over over the years um you know i know this dates me but my main job in college was working at Blockbuster Video, um, but the one you're probably talking about is the one I don't tell too many people about because it kind of freaks them out, but I worked at a morgue, uh, the night shift, and yeah, it's I didn't go knock on their door and ask, ooh, can I have the creepiest job in the world? <laughs> um, my best friend going through college, we went through the program together, um, it was her family business, and so... Uh, I actually went up there to study with her a few times and then kind of got used to it. And when they had a job opening, she said, hey. We all just like relaxing on this like stretcher next to... There were no, they, <laughs> there were no the gurney races, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually, it wasn't nearly as creepy as it sounds. It was, a, it was an old um, restaurant. Oh gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, okay. um it was an old restaurant that had been converted so it had it was a really big building yeah. and so all of the lab stuff was on one side and the other side of the building uh they built a full-fledged apartment with i mean it was it was nice it was carpeted yeah. and like it had satellite and i didn't even have that in my apartment so it was it was nicer than my own apartment so yeah um all I had to do was be there and sign the paperwork if there was somebody coming in. Yeah. So I'm just curious, and I don't know if you would know this question, but like, how how does a family get into the the business of running a morgue in an abandoned restaurant? <laughs> okay, I know the story because it's my best friend's family. Um, yeah. They they grew up owning a string of funeral homes, uh, and so. It was a pretty easy segue from there. Uh, she tells me stories, you know, about her and her siblings. There was a bunch of them. Uh, and they would, you know, go play hide and seek in the caskets. And it was just normal for their family. Yeah. You know, kind of the Adams family sort of 
thing, but um, yeah, it, I know it is a it's a weird job, and uh, every time I tell somebody I work there, they're they're kind of like, oh, "How did you like? Were you not creeped out?" Yeah. And I, honestly, I was for the first six months or so, but after that. It's really peaceful and nice, and I got lots of studying done, and I basically got paid to hang out at a really nice apartment. So, <laughs> you know, once I got over the creepy factor, it was a really great job. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I don't know if you're, like, legally allowed to disclose this or whatever, <laughs> but uh, you told us about... Uh, car crash victims like if you had a broken limb yes yeah there was i mean i saw a lot of stuff and i, I actually got to stand in and watch uh a, a lot of the autopsies that were performed uh i i was this close i really did become you know kind of fascinated mm -hmm. with it and i was this close to changing my major and going medical after that uh, but I was already in my fifth year of college, so changing majors again was not <laughs> not something I really needed to do at the time. So, yeah. But, I mean, it's something that it's always kind of been in the back of my mind. If I ever did go back to school, it might be medical school. Yeah, w would it be geared towards that, or was it just like this fascination of like... I actually, you're in these autopsies, and you're kind of like seeing how... I actually would rather work with the deceased side than the living side, honestly. <laughs> um, it's less nerve-wracking. Like, I'm you, not going to hurt dead. anybody. <laughs> um, and I am, I, I'll just be totally honest, I'm a little dyslexic and really bad with numbers, and you should not trust me to, you know measure medicines and inject live people um <laughs> so but it, but you're deceived loved ones <laughs> yeah well i mean it's it's totally different process and yeah. it was just i mean there was something very satisfying as weird as it sounds but that the whole purpose of that facility was to give the loved ones answers mm -hmm. you know and to say hey this is what happened um and that's that's a really, it's kind of a gift that you can give. So, so the uh, the place you worked at, was that geared specifically to, like, something where they would have to do an autopsy, or? Yes, so, um, all, very few of the autopsies that were um, done there were private ones, where people said, hey, you know, there's nothing suspicious here, but we'd just like to pay you to do one on our mm -hmm. loved one. Uh, mostly it was where there was some sort of, you know, circumstance where a county judge or, a, um, you know, whoever pronounced the person said, um, you know, hey, we need to make sure rule things out. And so they'd be sent there. Yeah. So honestly, that does sound fascinating. Mm -hmm. So uh, like, I, I could see, I don't know, I'm kind of squeamish about weird stuff. I but <laughs> never thought I would be able to just, you know, yeah, walk in and observe an autopsy. But um it was it was actually very fascinating. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I bet it would be. So you decided to stick with journalism. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 or and and PR, as mm -hmm. you said. So, wh where did you go from there? First, uh, actually, first day out of college, I graduated on Saturday, and then, well, I guess two days after college, and on Monday, my first job was. Uh, becoming the editor of the Frankston Citizen. So if you know where Frankston is, it's it's a little tiny... It's, it's a bustling metropolis. Yes, so. tiny, tiny little blip on the map between Tyler and Palestine, and they had a weekly newspaper. Mm -hmm. And uh, a family bought that newspaper after it had been owned by one guy for like 80 years, and they didn't know anything about journalism. And so as soon as they bought it as a business venture, they went, oh, shoot, uh, we need somebody who... It was journalism. Uh, and so, lucky enough, they called UT Tyler, where I was graduating, and said, hey, to my advisor from the student media, uh, hey, do you know anybody who'd be interested in, in this job? Yeah. Um, <laughs> they couldn't afford to pay very much, but it would be a great resume booster. And being somebody who was graduating, you know, that week, I was like, yeah, you know? Yeah. Young, and you don't have to pay me much. I just want to work. Um <laughs> So I did that for a year, which was, you know, I learned tons, um, learned so much. I was the writer, the editor, the photographer, the 
ad salesperson, the office attendant, and the delivery person. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm guessing just based on uh, what I'm gathering from the timeline, this is like early 2000s? Yeah, I see. Um, I graduated in 2006. So yeah, so okay. about 2006. So mid-2000s. Uh-huh. So I, I know, like, you know, from going through all your courses here, mm-hmm. uh, like, like right now... It, it's not a super profitable time for uh, you know newspapers and stuff. Oh just no, it's not. So, what was it? Was it sort of going into that time when they bought this newspaper, or so does it help that it's a small town? It was. I mean, I really think that was kind of a nobody knew that was a indication of things to come yet, mm-hmm. but. In retrospect, yeah, it, it was right at the tip of that time where small town newspapers started to shut down or sell for very cheap, and the entire print industry just started into kind of a slow decline. Um, they actually didn't want to hold on to the newspaper and offered to sell it to me, uh, and I was, I don't know, like 24 years old at the time. And they were going to sell it to me for the entire business for $100,000, which I know sounds like a ton. immediately agreed to. Yeah, I know it sounds like a ton of money, but I mean, to buy a fully functioning business, building included, is nothing. What about like uh, printing? Did they hire that out or was that in-house? That was hired out. They went to the the Palestine paper printers. Gotcha. Um, But I mean, I thought about it for... A couple of weeks. Yeah. And then I really, you know, just kind of came to the conclusion that this is not an industry that's going to probably stay strong. Mm-hmm. For, I mean, the, the the winds were already kind of changing that way. Everything was starting to go digital. Websites were becoming way more important uh, than the, the print industry. Um, and so I, I declined. And not long after that, I was offered a job at the Tyler Morning Telegraph. So... Um, I did switch over there and covered politics for Tyler for a couple of years and then went into the PR side. Yeah. So and, and I'm kind of interested, like, what what was, like, being a newspaper journalist slash everything else, like, for, you know, a small town? Uh, it, well, for Frankston, it was, I learned some lessons. Because yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm from Longview, which is, a, I guess, a medium-sized town. You know, it's got 100,000 people or so. Yeah. It's not Frankston, where every person knows everybody's family, you know, and their cousins and everything about them. And coming in as an outsider, I I had to really adjust to that. Um, I, I definitely ruffled some feathers when I first came in, just, you know, started changing things in their newspaper. And mm-hmm. um, the... Probably the biggest lesson I learned there, um, the first month, apparently for, you know, 80 some odd years, the front page of the paper once a month published a very large picture, color picture of whoever won Garden of the Month for the Garden Club. And I decided <laughs> you, you don't want to change that that was <laughs> not front page news. Yeah. And I put the picture on the inside of the newspaper in black and white. When I say little old ladies showed up with (laughs) their gardening tools to riot, I'm not exaggerating by much. They really, a a group of them came down to the office and were so angry um, that I ended up reprinting that photo on the front page the next week. Uh, in color, so that yeah. they could get full credit for their garden of the month, um, and so just you know little things like that that I didn't realize, like just coming in. Oh, I, you know, I learned all these things in school, and this is how it's supposed to be, and it's supposed to be hard hitting news on the front page. And in reality, it's a community newspaper, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, I, I've learned some humbling lessons about respecting the community and and what they wanted in their paper. Yeah, so. Um, I, I guess, like, it being such a small town, because you said it was a weekly newspaper, uh-huh. right? So, how hard is it to, like, keep up a newspaper filling all your pages and everything <laughs> in a small town? 
was not easy. <laughs> it was not easy. Lots of features, lots yeah. of, you know, finding somebody with a with an interesting enough story to tell that you could write a lot about because there was a, a lot of room to fill pretty mm-hmm. often. Um, I also started and this was a this was another battle. Um, I wanted to print the police blotter. One I think that's kind of an important thing for a community to know what what the arrests are in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, and two, it would be a space filler. <laughs> and so I thought that would be a really good idea. Well, going down to the local police station there and asking them for that week's police reports, the first time you would have thought I walked in there with two heads. Um, nobody had ever walked in there and said, hey, could I have these public information records, please? Um, it, w- it was a battle it took me months to at first you know you know, butting heads but then finally coming to you know bringing the information to them showing them the law and having a civil conversation and finally convincing them to to hand over those records every week yeah. so so i i guess what what was the battle over was it because it is such a small community people's reputations or was it just and most people just don't not, know that not knowing that arrest records are public information yeah um no i mean i don't think it was out of malice or trying to hide anything it was just nobody had ever asked before yeah and it was never something they had to deal with um but then once they did realize i'm sure there was a moment of oh well now everything <laughs> for everybody in this town is going to be out in public. So, yeah, I'm sure that was a concern. Yeah. Yeah. So you go from uh, the small town of Frankston uh-huh. to the uh, hustle and bustle of the big city, Tyler, Texas. So yes. what, what's that What's that transition like? It was very different. Um, and I loved working at the Tyler Morning Telegraph. It was back in the, you know, in the heyday of print journalism there was probably 30 full-time reporters that worked there in the newsroom it's just like you know an old movie yeah. um and my you job was typewriter <laughs> we're a little past typewriters <laughs> um but we i mean it, it wasn't that far past typewriters i'll be honest we had computers uh but it was still like their website was a brand new thing they had one person who knew how to post anything to the website so at the end of the day you had to go hand over a flash drive with your story to the webmaster and he Mm -hmm. would update the website with it um it was it was pretty great uh my beat was politics like i said city politics and so when you're given a beat there really isn't like an eight to five it's just you need to be where you need to be when you need to be there you need to know what's going on you need to have your finger on the pulse of that beat and you know just make sure you know everything that's going on so any given day was pretty random and i'm a kind of add person so that was really great that i didn't have to sit there and just you know type at a desk for eight hours that i got to go to a meeting and then you know go to lunch with one of the politicians and come back and write something and then i might go to another meeting and then you know go down to the local coffee shop and just kind of listen to everybody downtown who's got business with politics and i mean that was that was the job it was just kind of being being out there and listening to everything yeah so um this may be a dangerous question uh-huh. but uh does a circle a certain unnamed uh grocery chain really control have as much power as it has been rumored <laughs> um i I'll tell you, I know Garnet Brookshire. We actually grew up together in Longview. Um, and, yeah, they they do a ton for this community, honestly. Yeah. Um, they The amount of money that they donate to, like, the food center and uh, other things, you know, the hospitals and schools is insane. And so... You know, I, they are very much involved with the community, and they do have relationships with the politicians. And you know, I I've never personally seen anything to the negative of that relationship. Yeah, no, I, I've just people hear that I you know I do this oh, stuff, yeah. and they go, oh well, you need to look into, you know, whatever. So, 
<laughs> yeah, I, you know, and I don't know anybody from the Brookshires very well. Like I said, mm-hmm. you know, I knew one of them in grade school. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. But, um, but you know, from what I covered, yeah, they there was, you know, somebody from the Brookshire family who sat on, you know, zoning boards or building boards and, uh, you know, during a lot of it. And just like any other prominent family or, um, you know, anybody who owns a, a really successful business in this community, um, it's just kind of the nature of it. If you have a very successful business and you have the time and the money to spare, it frees you up to do things like serve on city council because those are unpaid positions. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's the, many, many of the big names in, in the Tyler area uh, served in, in a lot of those positions. Yeah. So you go on from uh, uh, local political journalism and mm-hmm. stuff. Do you do anything else in the in journalism, or do you just kind of transition into PR? So I that's where I flipped to the dark side. Uh, I went from <laughs> covering politics to doing PR for the local politics. Okay, so not the city, but the county. Um, closely related, covered a few county commissioners meetings, and you know when the person who covered those couldn't be there, um, and then that's where. I flipped over. I ended up doing the public relations for Smith County for six years. Mm-hmm. And is it like Parks and Rec? It is. <laughs> it is. <laughs> it is kind of like Parks and Rec. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. It, I mean, in in the most positive way. Yeah. Um, there's, you know, you have to have a sense of humor when you're dealing with angry people and public meetings and the pressure of figuring out how to spend a very, very tiny budget to make everybody happy yeah uh and that's that was a real challenge that was you know if if you're not familiar with what commissioner's court is it's basically the city council for the county so if you live in tyler there's city council for the tyler if you live in lindale there's city council for lindale but everybody who lives in between the big cities in the county Mm -mm. is governed by the county commissioner's court so they're like the city council for all that unincorporated area. So they have the same duties. They have a meeting every week. They collect taxes. They fix the roads. They, you know, they also run the jail um, for the whole county, which was a huge part of the budget. Uh, I am lucky enough. I, I, I'm actually really proud of this. Um, the first week I went to work for the county was the week that they started to campaign for a bond to build the jail addition. Uh, and the last night I worked for the county was the night they cut the ribbon for it. So it took six years to get it passed and built. Yeah. Um, but it was something we needed so badly. You know, so many people don't want to spend money on a jail. They're kind of like, oh, you know, criminals, we don't need to spend money on them. We want to build schools and parks and whatnot. But it's so important to make sure you have humane conditions and are avoiding overcrowding and other things that make an environment unsafe for, you know, not only the inmates, but also the people who work there. Yeah. So that was one of the things that I didn't know anything about going in and ended up becoming a little bit of an expert on the jail system in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> so, so was it just like through osmosis you got this expertise or was it like you had to set out? I had to set out research- at doing the PR for the county. Yeah. You know, the county decided they were going to try to pass this bond to get the money to build the jail. So my job was go out in the community and convince them to build the jail and give us money. Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah, I had to learn everything about it so that I could go out and make presentations and convince them. Yeah. So I guess what, because what was it during this PR time mm-hmm. that you decided to also start being an adjunct here so during the pr time is when i started doing my masters at night and so um and because that job was really demanding i only took one class at a time and yeah it took me a while to get there um so yeah it took me about five years to do my masters and um it was right at the end of of my time at the county that i uh i did that one class and then 
after that, you know, it kind of came to a crossroads. We were coming up on another election cycle, and my job was to work for whoever the five elected politicians were at the time. Hmm. And so you never know who your boss is going to be after an election cycle. And, you know, it was just the right timing. I thought, you know, I've seen this through. It's been a great six years, but I'm really feeling like education is the direction I want to go for the next part of my life. And I was offered a job at UT Tyler, um, coming in there as an adjunct and, uh, and a staff member. And then after a few years there, I was able to yeah. come here full time. So, I was adjuncting at both at the same time. So you, you talked about, I don't know if we were recording yet, mm -hmm. but you talked about how like you never, your whole family was educators. That's not what you wanted to be. So <laughs> what it, changed your mind? I don't know. Something snapped when I taught that first class. Um, yeah, my mom was an art teacher. My sister-in-law's a teacher. My grandparents were teachers. And I just saw the frustration and the, you know, lack of appreciation and the low pay. And I thought, nah, that's, that's not the direction I'm going to go. And then, you know, after working at the county for so long, I, it was a great job. I learned so much. I loved it. But it was very stressful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was on call 24 hours a day. And I had a nice paycheck. But... I was ready to move on to something where I didn't have to stress 365 days a year. Yeah. And so when that opportunity opened up, I thought, okay, you know, this is the time. And yeah. it just kind of fell into place. So <clears throat> how was the transition from doing into teaching? <laughs> I'm not going to lie. The first week I was there, there was a meeting because they had, you know, there was an emergency with... I worked in the advising office at first, mm -hmm. um, and the emergency was, you know, somebody's credits didn't transfer correctly. They might not graduate this semester. They might have to wait until the summer semester. And everybody was freaking out over it. And I was just like, <laughs> there's nothing literally on fire. <laughs> there's... <laughs> Nobody's, like, jumped off of the jail and broken their legs. No, You know, the yeah. state's not coming in to shut anything down. We can handle this. <laughs> and so it was a big adjustment. Um, that, yeah, the perspective on what, can, you know, constitutes an emergency changes drastically depending on what job you're in. Um, you know, not to make light of that person's situation. I you know, know they wanted to graduate. That's important for every student. But, yeah, going from... Life and the death. political and, and you know <laughs> yeah. politics and millions of dollars being handled and scandals and you know um gosh i worked at the county i mean like it's literal life and death the the summer of the wildfires in in 2011 where people died mm -hmm. uh and it was my job to to be on the phone with you know, KLTV and CBS and everybody and KTK and make sure when there was a dangerous situation from the fire marshal's office, you know, I was getting that word out to people so that they could evacuate. Um, so going from situations like that to... <laughs> the worst thing is somebody has to wait three months <laughs> to well, graduate. All of the administration has gathered to handle this situation because it's mm. the most important thing. I was like, oh, well, you know what? I asked for less stress. And here it is. Yeah. <laughs> that was confirmation. <laughs> so, so from going from uh, administration into like actual teaching, uh -huh. how, how was that transition? Okay, so transitioning from you know doing to teaching, uh, and going from administration over at UT Tyler. I started out at UT Tyler in, in advising, and I ended up. Before I left, I was working in uh, in the president's office uh, on the legal team, and I was handling all the public information requests over there. And so I went from being, you know, kind of in on the inner circle of administration uh, and, and helping with those problems to being completely out of the loop <laughs> for anything administration-wise going on uh, over here. And... It was lovely. <laughs> I, you know, this is the first job I think I've ever had in my life where 
of course, I'm always thinking about it. I'm always, you know, oh, that would be good for my class or, um, you know, I want to add that in or, oh, that would be a good discussion topic. But I don't have to take that stress home with me. Mm -hmm. like, I see my students every day. We have fun. I get to teach them some really cool, fun things. It's almost like playtime. Uh, there is a lot of grading, <laughs> but it is, it, it's, I don't know, it's happier than I ever thought it could be. And now I look back and go, what was I thinking when I swore I would never be a teacher? And now being here all these years later, it's it's kind of like, wow, that's that's what everybody in my family saw in it. I just hadn't been there yet. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a, a pretty good w ending uh -huh. to the story. Um, is, is there anything you would like to leave the podcast with? Or? Um, just, you know, give me a shout out when you get your Emmy for your podcast. Uh, and, <laughs> and donate lots of money to the Tyler Junior College Student Fund when you make millions of dollars on your podcast. I, I actually, when I graduated, I was planning on getting a plaque made uh -huh. that just said Isaac Belota Communications Department <laughs> <laughs> and putting it in the... <laughs> We would keep it for you. <laughs> We'd put it on a pedestal. Um, we still have your... I think there's a little handwritten note in our glass case over there from something you donated. Yeah, is it the, the film? The Edison yes. record. Yeah, yeah, it still says, donated by Isaac Belota. <laughs> yeah. It's in our official case. So, yes, your mark will always be here. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I try to leave my mark wherever I go, whether that's good or bad. But, uh, no, definitely... Uh, you know, if you are interested in, uh, you know, media production, communications, or whatever, check out TJC because it's a lot cheaper than going to a four-year school and deciding that's not what you want to do. That is, yes. <laughs> if there's anything else to add, I just want to, you know, emphasize how awesome junior colleges are for opening the door for affordable education. And you can go here to any junior college, really, for two years, figure out what you want to do without spending an arm and a leg. And then, as long as your grades are good, you can transfer to any of those major universities that, you know, you, you want to I, I brag mean, about. I mean, speaking of, like, Tippa, we compete with the major universities. Yeah, I mean, and not so humble brag, but um, <laughs> we got more awards than the four-year universities in Texas last year. Yeah, and, I th and the year before that, I think that's when I went. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, yeah, we definitely... I The thing I love about our program, um, and, you know, Derek Gray is the person who kind of put all this curriculum into place. Uh, there's such an emphasis on teaching real-world skills. Mm -hmm. Like, this is the stuff you need to know when you go get your first job. This is the stuff that, if you don't know it the first week of your first job, they're going to look at you and say you have a communications degree. Yeah. So it's not book work. We're, it, it's much more hands-on and it's much more, you know, relevant topics to, to what's going on in the media world today. We're constantly changing our curriculum to keep yeah. up. I, I mean, there was never a time where, at, le at least in these classrooms, right, for mm -hmm. the communications where I was like, I'm wasting my time doing this. Everything felt like it had a purpose. It was very hands-on, very collaborative, which was so much fun. And uh, like you said, it was kind of like playtime. So definitely... Uh, You're going to learn, you know, how to be a real reporter. You're going to learn those communication skills, how to write an AP style, how to properly set up a camera shot. Yeah. But but, but it's playtime while you're if, doing if it. That, <laughs> if that's what you want to do, though. Uh-huh. You know, and and like I said, like, it's so much cheaper mm -hmm. than going to a four-year school. And then even if it's not what you want to do, I think communications is one of the best majors you can go into. Because yeah. no matter what you do, if you are the one person at your accounting company that can communicate effectively, you know, that you know how to write something, you know how to take a good picture, you know how to put together a presentation, you know basic how to... Basic graphics. Basic graphics. <laughs> like, it's going to get you so far ahead so fast because yeah. most people don't have those skills. Uh, it's not something they teach, you know, in grade school for sure or high school. And then 
there's only certain majors that really get that at the college level, other than just your, you know, basic required speech class, uh, which most people take online now. So if you can actually go talk to people mm-hmm. and figure things out. Well, that, that's the thing, too, is it, it's not that I'm saying that this these classes are easy uh-huh. either, because it, d- it does force you. I had to go and reach out to people and talk to them. Get out of your comfort zone. <laughs> which, which it, 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 first time you do it, it, it's the worst thing you can do. Now it's my second job that I don't make any money at. You yes. Know? <laughs> Is, and, 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 and so much about it improves you. Not, not just as like, oh, you're going to be a news person, you're going to be a writer for whatever, but just communication, mm-hmm. uh, creativity, all that stuff. It's, I, I never regretted, you know, spending four years here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I should have just been two. <laughs> I, I took the scenic route as well. Yeah. <laughs> I think I was, I was 30 by the time I was done with school. I might not be done now where there, there might be another path. <laughs> yeah. Soon you'll be a uh, Dr. Hampton. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someday. <laughs> is, it, is it Dr. Gray yet or is he still on? Not yet. Actually, he's, he's going back for his master's in a different subject so it's not going to be doctor uh he started phd yeah yeah that's just (laughs) that's not part of the interview it's not part (laughs) kept that out yeah editor (laughs) but thank you so much for agreeing to sit down with me and it's been a lot of fun it's been fun to be back it is yeah it's great having you back thank you Oh, hi. You actually uh, made it to the end. Uh, Not many people do that. Um, I guess you enjoyed it. If you enjoyed it, go ahead and uh, like and subscribe. Share it with people if you want to. And uh, just tune in next time because I'm always interviewing different people. Uh, Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Hi.